you guys have your Bibles, turn uh, open to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 51. On October 17th, no, I'm sorry, October 31st, um, 1517, uh, over 500 years ago, uh, there was a German monk uh, who walked up uh, through his city and walked up the steps of his uh, of, of a church, of a local church, and he got to the door and he nailed a sheet of paper on there. I'm sorry, before I begin, if, if you have um, children, if the kids want to go back uh, to kids' church, um, you guys can go to the back. Uh, but um, so October 31st, 1517, this German monk walks up the, the steps of, the, of a local church and he nails uh, a sheet of paper uh, on the door. Uh, and on it, he pretty much aired um, what he felt what were things that uh, the church uh, was not addressing uh, when it came to um, matters of the faith and when it came to matters of Christianity. Um, what happened was, I mean, he's a monk and a monk, monk, monk and uh, at this time, what he, had, he began studying the scripture and he began to find what he thought, realized were discrepancies based on what was taught and what the scripture clearly said. Um, and so he went out and he put these, uh, he put this up on the door um, and this list um, came to be famously, no, famously known as the 95 Theses. Um, and this German monk um, is uh, the man Martin Luther. Um, and this event really spearheaded um, what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. Um, it was, um, and it was just really this attempt to reform uh, the church at that time. And if you're sitting here this, this uh, morning, uh, we're your direct products of that. Uh, it's this, uh, and so what the Protestant Reformation was is um, just a, a brief synopsis. It was um, a clarion cry to return back to the roots of um, of Christianity. Of and so they heralded the um, the cry sola scriptura that what we know about God and what we can believe can be found only in Scripture, and it's only through great uh, by grace through faith that we uh, uh, get to God. Um, and so uh, it was this, um, it's this huge movement. Um, really, it, it's, it's one of the de defining and dividing moments in history. Um, but um, Luther put these 95 theses up. And the first one uh, is, uh, the first thesis is one that I'm going to read. Um, now, when you think about the Protestant Reformation, um, the, again, the things that come to mind are things like um, the sole authority of Scripture. Um, or you're going to think of, of justification of, uh, of believers through faith, um, or the priesthood of all believers. But incidentally, it's none of that that Luther decides to use as his very first thesis, as his very first point, his very uh, first um, point of contention uh, with the church, with the established church at that time, um, is one of repentance. Um, and so I'm going to re read the first thesis. It states as follows. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Let me repeat that again. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. 500 years ago, it was, it was the first blow to the, to the established religious uh, machinery. Um, Luther recognized the entire life, our entire life is one of repentance, that if you are here this morning, if you are in Christ, we, um, let me start off by the bat, that you are saved by grace through faith, that you are secure in Christ, and if Christ has you, he will not lose you. But there's the idea that um, even though we're not perfect yet, right, so even though we are in Christ, we're not at our final uh, state where, of, of, um, where we're worshiping without uh, the weight um, of everything that entangles us. And so it's one of repentance where we're molded and shaped constantly uh, by looking more and more like Jesus. And so um, the question then is, well, then what is repentance? Because if you look through Scripture, um, it's used a lot. In fact, when Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospels, um, he and John the Baptist are pretty much preaching the same sermon over and over, and it's repent for the kingdom of God is, is at hand. Um, and so if you um, have any sort of knowledge of church, uh, 
of Bible background, you know the Bible is written in, in two languages, right? So we have Hebrew and Greek, um, and so they have two different words. And so since there's two different languages, um, you're going to have two different connotations of words. And so um, what I've tried to do is come up with um, a definition that I think is uh, true to the, the biblical, biblical portrayal of what repentance is um, and what God calls us to. So repentance means to feel remorse and self-reproach for the fact that you've offended a holy God and to change your mind about the way you think things should be and embrace God's view and God's views and standards. So repentance means to feel remorse and self-reproach for the fact that you've offended a holy God and to change your mind about the way you think things should be and embrace God's views and standards. So this morning, we're going to look um, at a psalm that kind of deals with that. Um, when I was young, I had um, a guy speak over my life, and he mentioned this psalm. He said, whenever I kind of screw up, whenever I fall into sin, it's the psalm that I turn to um, to kind of um, remind me, uh, to, to kind of prepare my heart uh, in prayer and to remind me of, um, of the salvation and security I have in Jesus. Um, and so Psalm 51, and this is one of those psalms where we actually know the context behind um, what was written. Um, and it's a story, it's written by King David. Um, and uh, if you have a Bible, it's usually going to see on the top, it's um, written by David when Nathan the prophet went to him after David had been with Bathsheba. Um, and so, uh, in case you don't know the story, I'm going to give you um, a recap of the story. David is the second king of Israel, right? He's uh, widely considered um, the penultimate king, really. Um, in fact, when uh, Jesus comes on scene, um, the, the Israelites are looking for a king like David. David is the shining um, shining star uh, of Israel, of Judaism, uh, really. Um, like David, like he's a boy and he comes out and the Philistines are attacking his people and they have a giant in front of them and all the army is scared to approach him and David comes out, right? This boy comes out and with a single stone knocks out the giant, right? And, and the people go crazy, like the women are flooding the streets and they're swooning um, because, um, because he's killed this Goliath. And so they start singing these songs. They say, you know, our current king, Saul, he's killed his hundreds, but David, he's killed his thousands, which is incredibly ironic because David's killed one guy, but already he's become this folk legend, right? And, 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 but he lives up to that. He lives up to that because he becomes this great commander, this great leader. Um, I kind of like him because he writes things like poetry, he writes music, um, and he's, uh, the, the scripture says he's a man after God's own heart. Uh, but he's a great leader. But he does have this um, smudge on his um, legacy, if you will. Uh, because see, one day, David, um, his army was out to battle, uh, and David decided to stay back. Um, and for whatever reason, we're not sure, but he's staying in his, uh, in his palace. And he goes out on the roof in the middle of the day, the afternoon, and he's kind of looking out across his kingdom. And so um, the palace is set on a hill, so he can kind of just look across the city of Jerusalem. And as he's chilling there, um, he sees a woman bathing, uh, and she's beautiful um, and overcome by desire. He gets his men to go bring her to him. He sleeps with her, uh, and he thinks it's okay, except she ends up being pregnant. So now David's, uh, and, and incidentally, her husband is a captain in David's army, right? And they're away out to battle. And so now David's like, well, crap, what am I going to do right now? Because she's pregnant. Her, her wife's away, or her husband's away. Um, people kind of know that, you know, my man, is, you know, brought her in for questioning or whatever. So what he does is he calls Uriah in from battle. Uriah is Bathsheba's, uh, Bathsheba's the one, Uriah is Bathsheba's husband. So he calls him in from battle, and he's like, look, you've been fighting really hard. Um, you know, take a couple days off. Take, take a night off, you know, and, and hang out with your wife. Um, you know, just celebrate a little bit, and then, then they go back into it. And Uriah is just a stand-up guy. He said, I can't do that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, do that. Um, and David's like, no, 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 really. I really think you should go out um, and you should spend some time with your wife and you should hang out. And Uriah's like, how can I do that when my men are out in the field and they're battling and how can I go in um, uh, with my wife? Uh, and Uriah's like, you know what? I'll, I'm just going to stay here and sleep in your court courtyard. So David's kind of frustrated. What do I do? Bathsheba's pregnant. Uriah is too righteous to even go in and sleep with her. And so he calls up the commander of his army, um, and uh, he's like, okay, listen, what you're going to do is um, you're going to put Uriah on the front of the lines, 
and then when the heat of the, when the battle gets really thick, you're going to get everyone else to pull away. Um, and that's never a good thing. Um, and uh, Uriah dies. So Uriah dies. David takes Bathsheba as his wife. And so uh, everything is kind of good, in a sense, for a year. Um, because although people know, um, you know, and, and David knows about it, Bathsheba knows about it, his guards know about it, his, his army uh, commanders know about it, um, everything is kind of like no one's really mentioned anything about it. And then a year later, a prophet comes up to David, um, and he tells him the story. And uh, it, it's really a parable. Um, and David gets indignant, and, um, and the prophet Nathan calls him out and saying, look, this is what you have done. You have stolen another man's wife. You have had him killed, and now you're living with this. And David just kind of breaks down. Um, it just hits David. Um, and so this psalm that uh, we're going to read uh, and look at this morning um, is, is his response to that. Um, it's his, uh, for me, um, and, and this is, again, one of the reasons why I like David. Like whenever there's a lot of things going on, what I like to do is write. And I feel like this is what David did. David comes up to him. He's like, oh, what do I do? He goes into his chambers and he pens this um, psalm. And so we're going to read that. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, if you would stand uh, with me uh, as we read the word and uh, I'll, I'll read it out. And if you don't have a copy of the scripture, um, I think it should be on the screen behind me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So do good to Zion and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. If you'd bow your heads. Father, we thank you for your word, uh, Lord, um, that speak to us, that speaks through us in letters and narratives and parables um, and stories and even through poetry and song, Lord God. Um, I, pr I thank you for your word, Lord God, that still speaks to us um, 3,000, 4,000 years later, Lord God, your word which is active, Lord, and alive. Holy Spirit, would you use these words um, to... Uh, bring us to repentance, Lord God, in areas, Lord, that we have not submitted over to you. Lord, would you speak through me and indeed even despite me? Um, and would you um, work something in hearts, Lord God? Would you draw people to you, Lord God? Would our, as Ben will pray, Lord God, our, our mind's intention and our heart's affection be drawn towards you, Lord God? And at the end of the day, Lord, I pray that we would leave with a greater view of who you are and what you have done for us, Lord God, and the hope that we have and the joy that we have in you. So be lifted up, Lord. Here I pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. So again, the reason I bring up this psalm uh, when we were deciding to go through the, uh, the series on psalms um, was uh, we're, we were um, talking about things that have kind of uh, impact or psalms that have impacted us. And for me, this has been one of those big things because um, I'm right there on that boat in the fact that 
I am saved and I know I'm saved. I know I'm bought with the precious blood of Christ, but I still fall into these patterns uh, of sin. Um, and so I, I still find need of repentance. And so um, as I was studying this psalm this week, um, I think there, um, there are patterns in it um, and there are themes within it that we can draw out um, and kind of apply to our own lives in the way we approach repentance, um, and, and, and hopefully we do. Um, hopefully uh, we still do repent of the things uh, that, um, that bind us and, and, as Hebrews says, so easily entangle us. Um, and so we, we can't go through every single thing in the psalm because we'd be here longer than, psalm pre uh, than Sam preaches here on Sunday mornings. We'd be here for hours and hours. And so uh, we're going to kind of go through it thematically. Um, and so the first step, uh, in achieving um, a culture of repentance, or really a heart of repentance, uh, is really found in the first verse, um, is, is to start with God and not to start with your own sin. Because see, a lot of, a lot of times when we think of re repentance, we think we start with our sin. We start with the fact that, you know, I've committed this sin. I'm so sinful. I'm so broken. I've done this. Um, and that's where we begin. But in what David kind of shows us, um, and what Scripture teaches us, is that what we must rely on is the character of God. Um, and, and there are several characteristics that David brings up in, um, in when, when he talks about God, when he, uh, that he uh, um, attributes to God uh, in these first couple of verses. He talks about God's mercy and his steadfast love and his ability to blot out transgressions and, and his ability to cleanse sins. And I'm not sure about you, but I'm sure, uh, but I think some of us have sinned and screwed up pretty big. Um, we've sinned big time, and, and we're often afraid to go to God, I think, because we have this skewed theological construct in that we think that God is just watching over us, waiting for us to screw up so that he can take us out, um, that we have to be perfect and, or, or have everything, all our ducks lined up in a row or straightened out for us to come to him. But if we realize that we didn't just one day walk into the kingdom of God, uh, but rather we recognize that God saw, from on heaven saw us floundering and, and, um, and um, stuck in our cycles of sin. We who had no hope, uh, who were drowning in our own brokenness and our own uh, cycles of sin. And didn't just, he, God didn't just throw us a lifeline, but in fact he reached down from heaven, grabbed us and picked us up and brought us and put us down on firm ground. Um, and brought us from death into life. And when we realize that, we realize um, that the nature and character of God, that God is a God of mercy, that God is a God of love. Um, this is grace and this is mercy that in spite of our sinfulness, um, God reconciles us with himself uh, in relationship and communion. And really, it's what set Chris, it sets Christianity apart from really every other major religious worldview out there. We didn't find God. We didn't find God. Rather, God found us. God pursued us. Uh, Christ found us and gave us his perfection. And that's the gospel. It's not that we're good enough uh, or special enough, uh, and, so, and that, thus God saved us, but because of his grace and for his own glory. When I was young, um, what I was taught, um, and I'm not even sure if this, was, uh, if this was directly or indirectly, but I was kind of taught this mindset um, that if I didn't have my act together, um, I was raised in the church, but if I didn't have my act together, when I came before God, that God was just going to take me out. You know, God God was just going to uh, lay me out. I was going to do uh, one wrong thing in the service um, and, you know, fall down dead um, or something like that. And this is a teaching that my life wasn't reflecting righteousness. God was on the verge of destroying me. Um, and this, this view really didn't give me um, a good reason to go to God. Right? In my brokenness, in my sinfulness, the last thing I wanted to do was approach God. Because what I wanted to do was clean myself up and clean my, um, you know, fix my behaviors, do this, uh, instill this into my life so that I was good enough. And then I can approach God um, and ask God for forgiveness or approach God and ask Him for His mercy. Um, and so um, God, Jesus really wasn't that great of a Savior. Um, in fact, if I could use um, an il illustration, He's more like... Um, it was more like I was in prison, um, and then God looked down and gave me a, hey, uh, you get out early on bail for good, for good behavior, and so you get out early. And so that's what Jesus kind of was uh, to me. Um, God was like my parole officer. I'm constantly supervising my actions and my reactions to things um, and to make sure that I was 
um, acting good enough before throwing me back into the slammer. But when we recognize the grace and mercy of God, right? We recognize that repentance really starts with God and his character. It doesn't first start with us, uh, first and foremost. Um, it doesn't first and foremost start with sin because um, if you begin to look at your own sin and, and when you, once you begin to look at your own brokenness, um, you, you'll start to get really depressed, right? Uh, once you start thinking about how jacked up you are and how all your attempts to fix your behavior, all your attempts to um, restrain or refrain from sin um, don't really seem to change you, um, and, and uh, how you hurt and you constantly disappoint the people around you, the people that uh, you care most about, how you decrease the name of Jesus, um, you're going to get pretty low um, and pretty depressed, like, like, like clinically depressed, uh, right? Like big time despair because of the hopelessness of sin, because sin in its very nature um, is what it, it, it draws out hope from you. But more so because your sin, um, it's the hopelessness of sin, but more so, it'll cause you uh, to maybe sink into depression because when you look at your sin, your sin will only take you as far as your sin and not beyond it. Um, like when you look at your sin, your sin will only take you to your sin and it can't take you beyond that because there's no point beyond that. And so David, even before he mentions his sin, even before he gets to his sin, he falls and he calls upon the mercy and the grace and the character of God. Um, it goes before the living almighty God to the one who can actually deal with his sin, the one who can actually do something about it. David falls before God and throws himself on the mercy of God um, and, and because what he deserved was death because, of, because what he's guilty of thus far is possible rape, but um, conspiracy, premeditated adultery, murder, um, and right off the bat he calls for mercy saying, God, don't give me what I deserve. Don't give me what I actually deserve. But he does call upon the steadfast love, the faithfulness of God. Um, that word for steadfast love, uh, is it's the beautiful Hebrew word that's used so much in the Old Testament. Um, and it's, it's this word, um, hesed. Um, it's used a lot in, in, in Ruth. Um, it's this thick word that means steady love. It means covenantal faithfulness. It means that even if I'm unfaithful, the one who has hesed will be faithful regardless. Right? No matter how many times you fall, I have this covenant with you. I have this agreement with you. And so that despite your unfaithfulness, I'll continue to be faithful. And that's what David invokes. David says, God, because of your steadfast, faithful, has said, have mercy upon me. David rests upon the God who keeps his covenants, who is faithful, who watches over his people, who actively saves them. Hesed means an enduring, faithful love and kindness that will not fail or let you down. It's used often in the phrase, the loving kindness of God. Whenever you see the phrase, loving kindness of God, it's the same idea. It is God's loyal love to his people. And it is this aspect of God's character that David calls upon to continue his fellowship and communion with God. God's character of loyalty was most present in telling, really, in sending Jesus to us to die on the cross for our sins. And so hear me, just as in our sin we are called to the cross, so also in our sin we must entreat the Lord to remember the cross in light of our sin. So let me repeat that because I think I just gave you a mouthful there. Um, just as in our sin we are called to the cross, right? In our sin we are called to the cross, so also in our sin we must entreat the Lord to remember the cross in light of our sin. And so the first step in starting with God, uh, is starting with God and His character, His loving faithfulness, uh, His hesed. So moving forward, David acknowledges um, his sin. A repentant heart owns his up to your own sin um, and the full extent of it. In, in verse 3, he says, um, cleanse me from my sin, from my iniquity. He is intimately aware of the depths of his sin. Um, do you know what I think? A sign of the grace of God is, it's that when we sin, we're actually convicted of it. Um, it it's, it's a grace and gift because without that conviction, you don't know how badly you've screwed up, right? If you didn't have that conviction, you'd continue, continue living that way, not knowing that you've offended God or that, you've, um, that you, what you're doing is an affront to the God of the universe. The grace of God is the Holy Spirit um, convicting us and allowing us to feel the weight and responsibility of our sin. 
And so because of this, and in this, there's a warning that we must be very careful if we ever get to the point where our sin just doesn't bother us, right? It's a dangerous place to be um, when we can't feel the grief of the Holy Spirit weighing upon our hearts, when you, can't sh- when you can shrug off the Holy Spirit and feel no, sh- feel no prick of conviction. It's a spiritually perilous place to be. And so what David does in these 10 verses between 2 and 12 is he owes up to his own sin. He says, this is my sin. He takes responsibility because what we often like to do um, is we like to go into the ifs or, or, or the buts or the whys of, of why we sin, right? And so our confession often goes something like this. Um, I know what I did was wrong, but, but this is what you have to understand, right? Um, I know this wasn't right. And, and we don't even really like to say sin, right? I know this wasn't right, but, um, but let me explain what happened. Uh, let, let me explain where I'm coming from. And let me explain how I'm wired. I know that wasn't right, but and, and we try to weasel out of sin by justifying all the reasons or all the things um, that cause us to sin um, instead of owning up to it and dealing with it ourselves. Well, you can say, well, Bryce, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know the kind of upbringing I had or how I was treated by so-and-so or what happened to me this many years ago. And, and you're right, I may not. But, and not decreasing the value um, or importance of any of that, but it doesn't have anything to do with the, willing, with the willful sinning we're talking about here. When Nathan the prophet um, tells David the story about this guy, he, uh, and so this is the story that, that Nathan tells David. He says this guy, had, he just had a few sheep, and one day this guy, this other guy came in and took all his sheep away. And David gets mad, and he says, that's ridiculous, kill him. You know, in fact, if you won't kill him, bring him to me right now, and I'll kill him. And Nathan says, bro, that's you. And do you know what David's response is in that moment? See, he could have, what David could have been, he could have been indignant. Uh, he could have said, okay, Nathan, you caught me, um, but uh, let, me, let me just explain what happened. Like, I was just chilling in my roof one day, right? And this girl is taking a bath in front of a window in the middle of the day. Who does that? Like, she was just asking for this. And so, I mean, I just acted upon, you know, my natural desires. And so I did that. Um, but David utters six words. He says, um, he doesn't try to justify himself. He doesn't blame it on someone or something else. He doesn't blame it on Bathsheba. He doesn't blame it upon anything else. Um, the Bible records six words that David utters. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. When Nathan confronts David about him sleeping with Bathsheba, murdering Uriah um, and others. It's a refreshingly simple and honest evaluation of his situation. I have sinned against the Lord. Um, In fact, he uses that same uh, choice of words here in verse 4. He says, against you, you only have I sinned. He's talking to God and and done what is evil in your sight. Uh, Now, if I'm hearing this, right, if I'm hearing David say this, I say, hold up, David, um, that's true, but I think you forgot about Bathsheba, and I think you forgot about dead Uriah here, because I think you kind of sinned against them. Um, you sinned against her, and you sinned against her husband, and then you had him killed. Um, in an indirect way, you sinned and were responsible for the death of the child through uh, which um, the, 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 that Bathsheba had that died. And so how can David say he sinned against God only? And, and what David is saying here is he's not um, lessening the fact that, that he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah by any means, but it, that it was a rebellion against God um, that was the root of his sin. That the reason he sinned was ultimately he was rebelling against the God of the universe, and his crime injured people who belonged to God and trans- transgressed the social order placed by God. See, when you and I sin, we do hurt ourselves, we hurt those around us. But we are ultimately, ultimately rebelling against a holy and just and righteous God and His established order. Against you have I sinned and done what is evil. That is our primary offense. So having a repentant heart, okay, A means um, that you go to God first, that you own up to your own sin and confess it. But the Bible beautifully promises us that if we're in Christ, If we confess our sins, that He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
That is the hope and assurance that we have that if we are in Christ today, this morning, um, that is what we cling to, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. The Bible also says that anyone who arrogantly says that he doesn't sin um, is a liar and the truth isn't with him. And so if you say you don't sin, you just sinned with that statement because the Bible says you're a liar and so you need to repent of that sin. But the Bible also promises that if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, um, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we don't have to worry or fear um, for when we sin because we have an assurance that if we are in Christ, when we confess our sins, we have a faithful covenant keeper who will forgive us of our sins. And so a repentant heart will own up to and take responsibility for your own sin. And so in this prayer, we get to verse 12, where David asks God to restore the joy of his salvation. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And the reason for this, and David says in the next verse, is so that he can teach other transgressors, he can teach other people who sin um, about the grace of, of the Lord and the joy that is to be found in his salvation. See, a heart that is repentant, a heart that is continually repentant is not silent, but sings and tells of the salvation and wonder and mercy of the Lord. Now, when I was younger, um, and when I, were, I would read this passage, um, I'd get it really troubled me a lot because I would think that David kind of sounded like a hypocrite here. Because I mean, really, David, you're just called out for these grave sins, and now you're saying, "Okay, God, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to tell other people about your faithfulness," but. That's not it, but in fact, what's going on is David is dealing with the weight and burden of his sin and the joy of God forgiving him and reinstating the joy of the Lord. And it's so overwhelming that what David wants to do is he wants to go out and he wants to share this good news with other people who are struggling in the same way, who are still stuck in their ruts and cycles of sin. What David wants to do is look, he wants to say, look, I found a way. Look, I know it's hard, and I know we get into these cycles of it, but there is a way out. There is a way that is better. There is even joy that is to be found despite this. Your sin and your guilt doesn't have to define you. You don't have to be defined by your sin. I found a better way. I found a joyful way. Because if you're dealing with this, it's okay because I've dealt with it too. And I found a deliverer to save us from our wretched sinfulness. David wants to go out and preach good news to those who are stuck in sin. He wants to preach the gospel. He wants to share the news of a better way of living that is freeing and life-giving and joyous. See, now Jesus hadn't shown up in the flesh yet at this time, but we um, who are on the other side uh, of Christ know that we have this great salvation and we have this hope for joy. And it frees us up that if you've ever read the four Gospels, you see that people are constantly interacting with Jesus, and they can't keep it in. People are constantly coming across Jesus, and what they do is they go and tell other people. Even when he tells them, look, don't tell anyone else what I did. What the first thing they do is go and disobey, and they go and tell people. So, so you read the story of Jesus one day at a well, um, and this woman comes up to him. And Jesus asks, him, asks her, hey, can I get a sip of water? Um, or, uh, and she says, yes. And then Jesus says, look, I can give you water that will never quench your thirst. And she says, that's ridiculous. Um, and, uh, and then Jesus, okay, just met this woman, proceeds to tell her, look, you've been married five times. And in fact, the guy you're staying with right now isn't even your husband. And then Jesus tells her that she, her whole life has been worshiping, um, kind of the wrong way. And what this woman does is she goes back to her town and she tells everyone, look, I've met the most significant person I've ever met in my life. I've met someone who knows me. I've met someone who's, who can change my life. And, and that's how the early church really gets started, right? Because under the pressure of uh, Judaism, under the pressure of the Roman government, you get this explosion of people just telling each other, look, this is what I was, but this is who I am now. This is the joy I have right now. This is the freedom I have right now. And under um, circumstances that normally you wouldn't consider a, an organization to grow, it does. It thrives. And 2,000 years later, we're sitting here still talking about it. We are direct products of it. They're just telling people about this person named Jesus who changed their lives, who forgave their sins, who gave them hope and a purpose. See, a repentant heart isn't silent because it realizes that Christ has accomplished what we, with our best attempts, 
at changing our behavior or our best tries at not sinning could never do. It give us salvation and freedom. It is an overflow of the gratitude and joy within our hearts. And it only really hits us when we see the impossibility of our situations. And so then finally, we get to verses 16 through 17, where he says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. A heart that is repentant is sincere. Or, to put it another, another way, a repentant heart seeks real change. Because remember, we're still in the Old Testament here, right? Where God is the one who's commanded these sacrifices and burnt offerings for the sins and transgressions of people. And David's not saying it's not important, but what he's saying is that the real thing that God is looking for is not just the stuff you do to appease God. God's not just after our external actions, but he's after our heart. Because see, even back in Deuteronomy, when God gives the law, he says uh, what it's supposed to do is supposed to be a reflection upon uh, the state of your heart. The sacrificial system is to be a symbolic representation of the state of a person who realizes the travesty of their sin. See, what we like, we like the quick fix, right? We like to kind of slap a label on it or to give money or to kind of do something to quickly appease the one we've offended. The easy way out. But God tells the Israelites that he is God and he doesn't really need sacrifices. He doesn't need burnt offerings and such. Like if that's what God really wanted, he wouldn't need us. He could just do it on his own. But what he wants is our heart. He wants a transformed heart that is broken over sin. And the fact that we've been at a holy God. It's one thing to say that you're a sinner and that you're sorry for it when you're confronted about it. But it's something altogether different to be cut to your heart. To be heartbroken of it. To be broken over it. You guys here, um, any college football fans? Yes? Okay, one. Great. Um, anyone here know who Johnny Manziel is? Yes, one. Okay, two. Okay. Um, you, you should. He's, um, he's the, uh, his nickname is now actually Johnny Football. Um, he's a quarterback of the Texas A&M Aggies. And I'm a Longhorn, so if you know anything about that dynamic, you know that my instinct, my initial gut reaction is just kind of like, you know, downplay him, kind of say, you know, he's not that big of a deal. They're kind of garbage. Uh, A&M. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're no good, but um, you can't really do that um, because if you've ever watched um, Johnny Football play, he is phenomenal, right? Like this kid is barely 20 years old um, and he's broken nearly every uh, offensive record in the NCAA, right? Like, like he's surpassed Cam Newton, Tim Tebow, and all that. Um, and, and he just came out uh, as a redshirt freshman. Um, pretty much came out of nowhere, came out from obscurity to win the Heisman Trophy, right? And so everyone's lauding him as the next great sensation. Like, I watched him play, and just game after game after game, he dominated, right? Like, he, he humiliated the number one team, uh, Alabama, last season. Um, and he just makes it look so easy. And he went from being a nobody to easily winning the Heisman Trophy. And now, I'm not meaning to uh, pick on him or call him out simply because he's an Aggie or because he's a football player, um, but if you've been watching at least ESPN the last few weeks, um, he's come under a lot of heat. He's come under a lot of scrutiny recently um, just because of um, he's still 20 years old. He's still maturing. He's still impulsive. He's tweeted a couple inappropriate things. He said some things. Um, he's uh, on social media, done some things that he probably shouldn't do in someone in his position. He's prone to quick tempers and such. And so the media and the press have just come down hard upon him, right? Like they're, they're just giving him a lot of heat on it. And so because of that, it's not even helping the situation, it's aggravating the situation. Like he's getting into more tantrums because of that. Um, and so actually just this week, um, just Friday, I was reading this article uh, written by this guy and he was talking about how um, Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football, uh, got uh, in front of local or in front of uh, national TV, um, and he sat down and and he apologized for his antics um, off off the field. Um, he apologized for for you know the tweets that he had and his pictures and his tantrums and and um, and just his behaviors. Um, but what stuck out to me in the article was the author of the article said. You know, yeah, Johnny Manziel said all these things, um, and he said all the right things that everyone wanted to hear, 
Um, but, but this is the author saying it. He's saying, but his posture and his tone and even the way he said it um, just didn't really sound like he understood what the big deal was. Like, like he was just kind of doing it to save face, to kind of save his reputation. He was doing it because that's what was expected out of him as a public figure. Um, he didn't get why people were upset over his tweets or his temper tantrums or, or drinking so much. He was saying the right words and he was trying to appease an offended audience, but he really didn't understand why he needed to. He was just doing it for the sake of doing it. And I remember reading that and slammed my hand down on the desk and said, that's it. That's exactly the posture that oftentimes we may have when we approach things like repentance because we understand that it's kind of offensive. We understand that it's bad. We don't understand the gravity of it. We don't understand who we are offending. We don't understand the levels of, um, of, of brokenness uh, that we have. Um, and now again, I don't mean to pick on Manziel here, but I, I think that's exactly what the psalmist is getting across. True repentance that falls on the mercy of God and acknowledges one's own sin that leads to sharing of the good news of salvation only comes from a heart that has dealt with sin and seen it to be weak and lacking and destructive. David says, a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise, which implies that there may be some sacrifices that God does despise. What's beautiful is that Jesus tells us that those are the kind of, kinds of people that, he, that, that come to him. Those are the kinds of people that he came for, the people that recognize their brokenness, the kinds of people that are cut to their heart, that see no other way out, that realize that I have screwed up royally. Because if you don't recognize your sinfulness and your brokenness, you really don't need a savior. You just need a self-help book. But those who see, those who really see the hopelessness of the situation, find a great savior in Jesus. Look, God is not after your gifts or your money or your attempts to appease him. He's, he's, he's not looking for your things. He's, he's not that petty. He's after the heart that loves and serves truthfully. A repentant heart sincerely seeks a genuine change. And church, the question I want to ask this morning is, are we broken over our sin? Like, like, like really, are we? And the reason I ask this is because I had to ask myself this question earlier this week. Because as I was studying it, and I was making all these notes and seeing all these things, I had to ask myself, Bryce, are you broken over your sin? And the frightening reality, if, if I can just be honest, I know this is church, so it's not an okay place sometimes to be honest, but if I can just be honest, was a lot of times I wasn't. A lot of times I kind of brushed things aside and said, okay, you know, that's wrong, and, but it's not really that big of a deal. Um, and and um, the way the Holy Spirit has been um, speaking and working through me this week without getting into the details is just convicting me about some of my relationships with people, convicting me in how I approach um, how I uh, how, how I approach things. And let me just say off the bat, I'm this one's this one's not in the point, but if you're gonna walk in repentance, don't walk in it alone. In fact, one of the things we preach almost every Sunday is don't walk alone in community. The Christian life was never meant to walk alone. But in repentance, bring some people on board with you. Confess and walk in humility and repentance with them. I pray this morning that that's what we would be. I pray that we would see sin as not just these things that we do that aren't that great, but offenses against the holy and just judge, who by the way is the creator of the universe the God who reigns on high. I pray that we develop a culture of repentance and confession where our lives would be lives in repentance of our rebellion and clinging to the mercy and grace of God. Because you see, see something beautiful happens in a community of people who have this culture of repentance, the mindset of repentance. They don't see themselves as better off or as higher or more righteous or holier than anyone else. No one is trying to impress anyone else. Repentance levels out the playing field. It makes us all equal. Because we realize that all of us, every single stinking one of us in this room, from the pastor to the baby to the drug addict, is a mess apart from the grace and mercy of God. We're hopeless aside from the mercy of God. We look at the holiness of God 
and our sinful and then we look at our sinful brokenness and our inability to match the God's righteousness and his perfection and we look at the cross and we look at Jesus and his death and not only his death but his resurrection and we see how he dealt with our sin and satisfies God's holy standard and we realize that we're all the same hopeless sinners saved by the grace of God that is the hope and claim uh, that is the hope that we cling to this morning and this morning we get to celebrate that in a rich um, in a rich way um, in a way that we do every Sunday here at the Loft in taking communion with, with one another. Because as, as a community, we recognize um, that we're all screwed up people, except for the grace and mercy of God that draws us and that saves us, that, that picked us up from the mire and clay and set us on solid ground, that creates a clean heart within us, that assures that God will never take His Holy Spirit away from us because we are His, His people. As we take communion this morning, I pray that you reflect upon your own lives, maybe even areas that you haven't repented of, that you haven't confessed, that you kind of hold on to um, these bastions of sin. I encourage you to confess it and repent of it in a way that we fall before God's mercy. We fall before God's mercy, acknowledging that it is He who saves us, not our, not our attempts to fix our sins. Owning up to our sins. Having our sins lead us to share with others the good news that we've received. And all the while, having it be sincere. How we do uh, community here at Loft is the band's going to be singing, and as you do business in your heart, um, as you feel led and compelled, you can walk around and grab the elements uh, from the tray. These little packets, like the wafer on top and the little the juice on the bottom. And uh, Sam will come forward um, after everyone's grabbed one if you feel compelled, and he'll pray for us. And we'll partake of the body, the, the symbolism of the body of Christ together. And then we'll drink of the cup together, realizing we're part of a new covenant. Father, God, I just thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that still convicts us, Lord God. Lord God, that when we stray and when we are far from you and when we screw up lightly or royally, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit pricks our hearts and reminds us that that's not who we are. That that's not our identity. It reminds us that this is not according to your plan. God, I pray, Lord God, that you, you would deal with our hearts, Lord God. If there are areas that we have not surrendered over to you, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would humble us. I pray that in confidence we would run to Jesus not in fear that you're going to strike us down or throw us off, but in confidence knowing, Lord God, that you love us, Lord God, and that you reconcile us with yourself. Lord God, I also come before you recognizing, Lord God, some of us are screwed up pretty bad, and we don't know. And Lord God, we live with the guilt of our sin and sorrow, Lord God. Lord God, I thank you that you remind us, Lord God, that even though through this whole spectacle of David and Bathsheba, Lord God, we get to Matthew, we find out that, that Bathsheba is in the royal lineage of Jesus, Lord God, that you redeem something, Lord God, that, that for all practical purposes seems such a disgrace, seems such a waste, and you redeem that, Lord God. You allow it to fall into your perfect will. And Lord God, that is what you do with our brokenness, with our sinfulness, with our mistakes, Lord God. You redeem it, Lord God. I thank you for Jesus, Lord God. I thank you for Jesus. It's his name I pray.